à une des fondations universitaires de Belgique, à the heart of Europe, in Brussels, capital of the EU and capital of Belgium. I am Nicolas Zapier. It's my pleasure to interview today Ivan Adamianovic, the author of the European Union and Institutional Investment Law Reform between uh, Aspirations and Reality, just published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, I read with much pleasure and interest your book, which amounts to a real tour de force on the account that you encompass a broad array of topics. Uh, could you explain to the audience uh, the main content of your book? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. So my book evolves around the reform of international investment law, and in particular, I examine this reform is envisaged by the European Union. So the idea of a shift from an arbitration model in investor state dispute settlement to a more court-like model. Why is the European Union attempting to reshape instrument investment law? So the EU is a newcomer to this field and it has experienced a number of problems when it started negotiating big trade agreements with ISDS. Mm. So the idea of the EU is that this reform should enhance the rule of law in international investment law and hence lead to more legitimacy in this field. That means more acceptance of ISDS among the public and the member states. Yes, the stakeholders. Uh, so far you have been emphasizing many times reform, reform. Is your book only about uh, the attempt to reform the system? Well, the book is much broader than that. Uh, what I, in essence, try to do is to compare the two systems, so the EU legal order and the international investment law as two subsystems within international law. So I'm looking at the conflicts between the two systems and the, the, the reasons for those conflicts, as well as the cross fertilization of norms. So how are the two systems influencing each other? So your analysis straddles uh, on both legal system, international law on the one hand, and European Union law on the other. That's right, yes. International investment law is known to be highly technical. In addition, there is no shortage of books on this legal discipline. How did you avoid to uh, fall in the trap of the technicalities and what's the added value of your book? So my analysis focuses on systemic issues both in relation to substance and procedure of international investment law and I relate those systemic issues to the theoretical framework, the rule of law as a legal concept and legitimacy as a political concept. Is the audience restricted to lawyer? Of course, primarily the objective was to explain international investment law to EU lawyers like yourself and EU legal system to international investment lawyers, so to provide those two perspectives. But also I bring law and politics of international law in this book together. It seems to me that your book is not only concise and comprehensive, in addition it provides a legal view on the interaction between EU law and instrument investment law. Yes, that's right. You work and live in Australia. Could one stress that it was too far-fetched, it was too ambitious to carry out such an analysis from Australia? Well, I'm both common law and civil law lawyer, so comparative method is my way of thinking. I also worked previously as a diplomat, so bringing different international perspectives was my job. While I worked in Europe, I gained that internal perspective on the EU. This was complemented with an external dimension in Australia. 
also while I did this research I spent a lot of time in Europe I participated in a number of conferences here in Brussels but also in other parts of Europe and the world so in Asia Australia the US to the best of my knowledge you even co-organize conference in Europe it's very interesting thank you Can you tell us how your narrative unfolds? So the book is divided in three parts. In part one, I explain international investment law, its main features, the tensions within the field, challenges for the reform, as well as the theoretical framework for the analysis. I imagine that this framework is necessary to explain the manner in which the EU envisions to reform the system. Exactly. So against this background, in part two, I explain the EU's reform internally within the EU. And then in part three, I move to the external aspect of the EU reform in its bilateral relations with third countries, as well as multilaterally in UNCITRAL. It occurs to me that you succeed in bringing together an array of topics, a policy and law, substance and procedure as well as the EU internal and EU external uh, visions of the subject matter. So time and again you mention reform, however there is always a risk that it would be an endless reform. Is there not a risk that the book will be quickly outdated? Of course, the reform is ongoing and it's a long-term process. What the book provides is the explanation of the challenges for this reform. It looks at EU's aspirations for the reform and the reasons for that reform, as well as the political reality. Aspirations and reality, that's the subtitle of your book. Does it mean that there is a risk that this reform will fail? Well, I don't make any predictions about the success of the reform. What I provide is the reflection on EU's proposal for the reform. And perhaps, since we are in Belgium, the EU will need a Belgian solution with a Brussels effect to succeed. Indeed, today is very Belgian weather. Even Adam Janovic, I'm convinced you are filling a gap in the literature. Thank you.